seven-year-old grandson told us last week, um, I'm not good at patient. I'm thinking, mm, I think your parents probably have said that to you a few times because he was owning it. I, I'm just not good at patient, you know, like it was supposed to be an excuse. Uh, but I suppose what we really desire is control. Um, trusting God can be really difficult when we're obsessed with control. Waiting seems almost impossible and surrender feels like a foreign concept when we're striving and struggling to keep things in our control. It's such a grasping. But God doesn't operate the way we do. And in fact, it's when we release control and surrender to him that we find true peace. We think that peace comes when we're in control. Like, I'm going to be in control and this is going to be good. You know, <laughs> I've got this. And we think things are going to end out well, but it's actually when we release it. Because peace comes when we surrender to the Prince of Peace. Waiting is really what Advent is all about. So often we equate waiting with worry. Think about that. I'm waiting, I'm anticipating it that way. And seasons of waiting feel hard and difficult. But what if we changed our perspective and realize that seasons of waiting are really seasons of anticipation, looking forward to. Instead of viewing them as frustrating or lonely. And over these weeks, we're going to see that what God says, we're going to see what God says about waiting and realize that waiting is really anticipating God to work, to do something. One of the commonly used words, Hebrew words in the Old Testament that's translated as wait is the word Q-U-V-A-H. And if Dan were in the room, he would tell me exactly how to pronounce that, uh, Dan. But I'm going to say kava because I don't know. But I shouldn't have told you that because you thought I did. But the word, um, it might give us some insight into what it means to really wait on the Lord. Because that's something we're commanded to do, to wait the Lord. Often we think as waiting as passive, like, well, I'm just sitting around waiting. I'm waiting for somebody to come pick me up. I'm waiting to go here. I'm just sitting around and waiting. But actually, waiting on the Lord is very active and not passive. The word kava means to wait, to look for, to hope, and expect. So it's not just sitting back and waiting, not just sitting around. It's actively looking for God to show up in the middle of our circumstances. <laughs> I'm looking for you. You know, it's kind of like hide and seek, but we're looking for where God is going to show up in our circumstances. And we have hope. We believe in what we can't see. We know that he's going to show up. Even when it doesn't make sense to us, we can have that hope. Advent's about waiting with anticipation for the Messiah to come. We're looking for him. It's about putting ourselves in the position of the people of Israel who waited waited for their Messiah. And when we do that, it reminds us of God's faithfulness to keep his promises. We look back in joy knowing that the Messiah has already come and we praise him for his faithfulness. The season of waiting for him to be born is over. But we still have waiting in our life, don't we? We have other seasons of waiting. Our lives are filled with waiting. But in Advent, we can anticipate the faithfulness of God in the waiting. We can be encouraged with how he was faithful to come to the manger in Bethlehem and learn to trust him to be faithful to us in the seasons of waiting that we find ourselves in. We can be encouraged to know that he is working in the waiting and we can worship in the wait. The theme of waiting started right at the beginning of scripture. God created the world and rested in the satisfaction that all was good. And then he created man and woman and declared them to be very good. And God had given them everything they needed and they walked in communion with God in the Garden of Eden. And then the serpent showed up. The crafty serpent made them doubt the stipulation that God had given to them because he had commanded them that they could eat of anything except for the tree at the center of the garden. And the serpent made them doubt the goodness of God. It's not unlike the way the enemy comes at us by 
uh, seeking to make us doubt that God has given us what is best for us and that God is working in our on our behalf. Eve ate of the forbidden tree and Adam was with her and he ate as well and in that moment everything changed. Sin entered the world and Adam and Eve when God came to them there in the garden to, to find them they tried to shift the blame to someone else. Well the serpent made us do this but it was sin of their own doing. <clears throat> And, but in that moment, when God came to them, he gave them a promise that they would have to wait for. In Genesis 3.15, God spoke words veiled in mystery, yet they were words that were the hope of mankind. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God promised that though there would be consequences for their sin and they would have to leave the garden, hope was coming. One day there would be an offspring or a child who would be bruised in the heel by the serpent, but that child would crush the head of the serpent. It's probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and praying in agony. And Satan is you know, there. You see him in bodily form in the movie and you know the snake comes out from under his gown and goes over to where Jesus is on the ground praying. And Jesus raises up and looks at Satan and he just smashes that serpent right in the head. They had eaten the forbidden fruit and Satan thought he had won the battle. But what he didn't know was that God was about to reveal hope to broken humanity. It's the first mention, Genesis 3.15, is the first mention of really the gospel, the hope of the gospel that we see in the entire Bible. And we see that even though there are consequences for sin, there is also the greatest blessing the world would ever know. Because at the cross, Jesus' heel would be bruised, but the cross would also crush Satan. And here in this verse, we find the entire plan of salvation revealed. God was going to send Jesus to rescue and redeem his people from the curse of sin. That is a glorious promise. It is here that we see this glimmer of hope in Advent, that a Messiah is coming, hope is coming. But many years would pass before Jesus would come. A long season of waiting stood between the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross. And yet through the season of waiting, God was always faithful to his people. He had promised a deliverer and he would send him at just the right moment. This is why we celebrate Advent. We celebrate that God keeps his promises. And this emboldens our faith to trust him to continue to be faithful. So this morning, I'm not sure what you are waiting for. What you're waiting for this Christmas. I talked to someone this morning who has young children and their children are so excited and waiting, you know, for Santa and the gifts. But maybe you're waiting for a change or for a better year, or for COVID to finally be over. I think we're all waiting for that one. Waiting for trouble to cease. Or maybe you're like my grandson and you're just not good at patient. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm encouraging myself and I encourage you to change our perspective about waiting. Instead of impatiently waiting, May we have an eager anticipation, looking for God to show up in the middle of our circumstances and trusting with full, full, full assurance <laughs> that God is faithful and he does what he says he will do. Can I go back to that verse, Psalm 1830? This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He does what he says he's going to do. And he is a shield for
for all those who take refuge in him. I had a friend send me a card yesterday. I'll just end um, with this verse. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He is faithful. So even at this Christmas, as we wait and we um, experience some of the waiting that the people of Israel waited for their Messiah, may we have full assurance, this hope without wavering, because we know we've seen that God has been faithful and we believe that he will be again. Morgan's going to come and lead us in a more um, modern version of Come Thou Long Expect to Jesus. And you'll find those um, verses in your books as well. You're welcome to um, sing along. You're welcome to just listen to whatever um, you feel led to do this morning.
this every week during the Advent season to be a part of the service. And it's unfortunate that you can't be in the room with us and have the meal that we've had today together. You missed out on that, but hopefully you uh, enjoyed uh, this part of the Advent season. And I'm going to ask that you receive the benediction. God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. And Father God, we pray that our control would be turned over to you. So that would be our very experience today. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.